physicist is extremely high. Uh, for example, in one cubic centimeter, if you could take the raw energy in that cubic centimeter and condense it into mass, divided by c squared, you would have more observable mass result from that than our largest telescope can see in the observable universe and all the stars and planets today. And so the, the energy that's there is extremely dense and extremely fierce. This drives everything that we call physical reality, from the quantum level right on up to the observed level and the observed world that we live in. Everything is energetically driven by the vacuum. The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats was a revolutionary book written by T. Henry Moray, an electrical engineer and Tesla enthusiast who in the early 20s began working on a device he claimed intercepted radiant energy from outer space. His solid state detector, the Moray valve, was designed with a complex series of semiconductors, high voltage capacitors and transformers hooked up to an antenna and a ground wire. By stimulating the existing oscillations of space energy, his radiant energy device ran for days, putting out 50 kilowatts of electricity. His public demonstrations attracted newspaper coverage and scientists from Bell Laboratories and the Department of Agriculture's Rural Electrification Administration. Although no one could find evidence of fraud, neither could anyone explain how the radiant energy device worked. During the 30s, developed semiconductors and transistors that were far ahead of their time. Unfortunately, as all too many inventors have suffered, when he refused to sell out to powerful interests, Moray and his family were threatened, shot at, and their laboratory ransacked. Ignored by the U.S. Patent Office, Moray quietly stopped public disclosure of the device after it was destroyed by his assistant, Felix Frazier, a communist sympathizer who was frustrated when Moray declined his repeated offers to take that technology to Russia. Today, Moray's sons, John and Richard, continue to pursue their father's dream. In Europe, Victor Schauberger's vortex experiments during the 1930s resulted in an advanced understanding of how the spiraling motions inherent in all natural systems reverse the effects of entropy. By studying the properties of inwardly spiraling water, he created an implosion generator that concentrated electrical charge. Victor Schauberger is one of my heroes who talked about a, a possible science based on the, the uh, inward motion rather than the let's explode everything, blow, break it up and, and uh, study the atom by breaking it up into little pieces. Let's study the atom by looking at uh, how it wants to move naturally in a spiraling motion. And the same with uh, everywhere you look in nature. Schauberger's ideas became widely known before World War II when he was coerced to work for the Nazis on exotic discs that resembled flying saucers, as well as his energy generator. In 1958, he traveled to the United States where he was told he could manufacture his devices. But he was duped into signing over all of his rights and none of his inventions were ever developed. Returning to Austria, he died a bitter and broken man. Visionary philosopher, artist, and scientist Walter Russell's contributions to the understanding of energy are significant, even though ignored by mainstream academia. Russell's revised periodical table of the elements, based on a spiral, predicted many unknown elements and isotopes like plutonium and deuterium. His cosmological theories about the mystical nature of reality challenged physicists to think in terms of energy, light, and matter as one substance. There's electricity in the air. It's a common expression and one that's true. Take a comb, run it through your hair on a dry day, and you can get a static shock. Sure, it's electricity, all right, but could it also be tapped to produce sufficient energy we could all use? Benjamin Franklin is credited as being the inventor of the electrostatic motor back in the 1700s, but its power output was modest. 
The Wimhurst electrostatic generator is a high voltage mechanism developed in the 1800s which can be hand or self-started and will produce dramatic sparking while charging Leyden jars. Today it's used in teaching about electricity, but its practical applications are considered inconsequential. A high-tech variation of the Wimshurst device is the Testatica, or Swiss ML converter. Developed by Paul Baumann of the Maternita community in Switzerland during the 70s, this free energy device is a marvel that has been in operation for more than 20 years, supplying electricity to the small, self-sufficient Christian community. Many technical experts have come away stumped by its excess output. However, because the community feels that the majority of mankind is not ready to be responsible for such unlimited energy, they're keeping the technology under wraps until such time the world is spiritually prepared. Other researchers, like Dr. Oleg Jefeminko, continue to pursue real-world applications for harnessing the electrostatic motor. His accomplishment, I feel, is the best, is that he used a specific type of electret which is a waxy substance which holds charge and uh, it's like a, uh, in many ways a magnet, electrical analog of a magnet. And he's achieved a 0.1 horsepower motor, which is a small device. So, and this runs continually on atmospheric electricity. Like the homopolar generator, the electrostatic motor is based on the dynamics of our Earth environment. As with wind and solar power, they offer real sustainable alternatives that with only modest gains in efficiency, could contribute to the replacement of our current dependence on fossil fuels. Are we clever enough to learn from the clues our planet is providing? Upon the foundation of innovative thinkers and inventors like Tesla and Moray, the modern age of free energy research began. In the 1950s, as waves of flying saucer sightings occurred throughout the United States and while an infant space program was trying to catch up with the Russians' launch of Sputnik, a man named T. Townsend Brown was busy on experiments that defied conventional understanding about electricity, gravitation, and propulsion. Along with doctors Paul Byfield and Agnew Bonson, Brown took high voltage to the next extreme. In this rare home movie, the earliest experiments in electrogravitics are recorded. By using high voltages over 20,000 and up to 200,000 volts, Brown discovered that highly charged capacitors would exhibit a noticeable thrust in one direction. Although awarded a patent for his electrokinetic generator, no one has ever reproduced his experiment until recently. Larry Davenport, shown here demonstrating his replication of Brown's electrokinetic apparatus, explains. But when I first began to read brown stuff, I didn't quite understand the difference between the ion wind devices, which there's a lot of them out there, and some of them are, are very efficient as far as producing ion wind, and his particular apparatus. I finally decided to do Brown's work in, in uh, 1994. I looked at his device, and I'd, I'd tried several different things, and they hadn't worked, and I thought, well, Brown is supposed to be the pioneer of this, or so the people that make the claims and that uh, get the patents, they always refer to his name. So I thought, I'll go back and I'll try to do this. Getting it balanced was real important. His uh, method of propulsion specifically was using the charge separation, high voltage charge separation on a vehicle. He found that uh, circular craft were better for that application than uh, wing craft. However, um, Recently, we found through uh, Dr. Paula Violet's research that the B-2 bomber actually seems to qualify as an electrogravitic craft. Uh, the military has admitted that it uh, electrically charges the forward leading edge of the wings. Uh, there's also a very high dielectric being used. Depleted uranium is used on the uh, forward edge of the wings. 
and whether or not there are other applications for that technology in that uh, design, we're recognizing that because the exhaust gas is also negatively ionized, that all of a sudden we have the high voltage charge separation that's necessary to provide an extra propulsive force, especially at high velocities. So electrogravity uh, in that um, aspect is a very simple process, but does provide a good amount of force for a very small amount of energy input. As with many other promising inventions developed during the Cold War years, the National Secrecy Act prevented scientists like T. Towns and Brown from commercializing or even publicizing any technology which could potentially be interpreted as having a military application. The triumph of America's space exploration program gave way to the era of limits in the late 70s. The infamous energy crisis made us all aware of our dependence on finite resources. Many inventors promised dramatic results with devices they said would solve the crisis. Claims of overunity, where power output exceeds input, were routinely announced. But when put to the test, most of their crude prototypes performed poorly, or not at all. Measuring methods were, and still are, extremely difficult to perform accurately. The few that did achieve modest gains in output were dismissed by mainstream academia and denied patents. And without patent protection, investors have no financial incentive to lay out the millions of dollars it takes to mass produce and market these devices, no matter how promising the technology. And after all, classical Newtonian dynamics got us to the moon, and Einstein's E equal MC squared explained that energy could neither be created nor destroyed. Anything else which seemed otherwise was labeled perpetual motion, unworthy of scientific examination. Uh, when I started out in 1980, um, free energy was something that we didn't talk about. We talked about it under, behind closed doors. Uh, the conferences often were visited by people we didn't know, and, um, and the information was spread in various means so that all of a sudden nonconventional energy, which was a phrase we developed, uh, was appearing in uh, military solicitations. So it's, it's, a, it's a controversial topic that at that time actually had the connotation that there was something from nothing. Therefore, it was unscientific, and these are a bunch of lunatics who are talking, and um, sooner or later the scientists will educate them about what's uh, um, the various laws of physics that are being violated. Well, most of the scientists equated any notion of a free energy or over-unity device as being a perpetual motion uh, machine and therefore utter nonsense. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a play on words. The scientists interpreted it one way, the guys trying to do it are looking at it as an open system. Now, fortunately today, we have a type of thermodynamics. Uh, you know, Nobel Prizes have been issued for it, to Prigogine, for example, uh, for systems not in thermodynamic equilibrium that do have their open systems and the energy does flow in from outside and through them. Those kinds of systems can produce over unity. It's all perfectly legitimate physics. Today, most scientists are unaware of the literature that the zero point energy even exists, mainly because most scientists aren't physicists. Now, a few of the, I went to school and I became a PhD, getting a PhD in electrical engineering and systems engineering, and not one professor ever heard of it. And yet, there it was in the library. So part of it is most scientists are special.